I have to read from the yeah. Depth of Field magazine, and uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Comics and Pop Music panel. Ever since I was a little kid, these two art forms have been inextricably linked in my mind. Um, some of my earliest memories were sitting in my old brother's room, reading all of his Marvel comics while he played records. So the Ramones and the Flash and the Fantastic Four and Captain America and the Falcon and Jack Kirby and Sorenko and Don Heck and Tom Verlaine and Gray Davies and David Bowie. All these things just fit together in my brain from day one. And as I grew older, I kept finding ways that these forms crossed over and mingled. Uh, you know, in the 50s there were horror comics and rock and roll and attempts at censorship. Uh, Marvel came up in the 60s and there was underground comics and psychedelic rock and garage rock. There were punk revolutions in the 70s. And through it all, you know, comic artists designed album covers and comics wrote stories and created stories about musicians and music. And the two worlds just eventually grew to dominate our popular culture today from you know, humble and uh, occasionally scorned origins. It's uh, they're two uniquely American forms and two things that I love greatly. So uh, with that, I'm going to get to it because we have a lot of panels and not a lot of time, but a lot of things to talk about. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the panelists. China Clips and Flores, am I pronouncing that correctly? China Clips and Flores, um, the creator of Blue Monday and Scooter Girl. Blue Monday was the first comic that I really saw um, in the 90s that sort of changed my perspective of how music and comics could work together. Every issue had a playlist musicians featured as characters. The music was an integral part of the stories, and uh, China continues to put out incredible, incredible <coughs> work. Um, one of my favorite creators, and I'm really pleased to have her here, China Clips and Flores. Down on the end, there's Matthew Rosenberg. He's the founder of Ashcan Press. Uh, he is a former record label owner or runner. He ran an indie punk label. Um, he is the co-creator and author of Ghostface Killer's 12 Reasons to Die comic from uh, Black Mask Studios, Black Mask Press Studios. Black Mask Studios. Uh, Matthew Rosenberg. Amy Chu uh, is the creator and editor and writer of Girls Night Out, a series of comics in New York, which are music is an integral, integral part of them. She recently had a story in the Virgo CMI YK anthology, which is very music centric and an incredible up and coming creator. Amy Chu. Jennifer Guzman is a uh, creator and writer. She's the director of trade book sales in it. She's done a bunch of small stories that I really enjoyed that featured music very prominently. Uh, I should get on with the introductions. Uh, Jennifer Guzman. <laughs> Alice Sierra, uh, writer, director of publicity at Archie Comics. She's a member of some of the Archie Meets Kiss crossover, which if you haven't read it, is every bit as bizarre and amazing as it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> Alex Segura. <laughs> John Short is the director of publicity at Oni Press, uh, which is the publisher of Blue Monday and Scooter Girl, also Hope the Savages um, by Japan Meter, and many, many other books. Scott Pilgrim, you might have heard of that one. Many other comics that meld these worlds of comic and pop music in really interesting ways. Uh, our late arrival, Vivek Tewari, uh, the, the writer Sorry, the writer of the, I think they're entitled, writer of the New York Times bestselling and newly Eisner award winning The Fifth Beatle Brown. Yeah. Bit about how 
these two things fit together in my mind, but everybody here on the stage also has none of these two worlds in their work. Um, and I guess we'll start, I guess we'll start on this end of time. Like, what, what made these worlds come together for you? What made you want to put these things together? Yeah, the comics uh, were to me just storyboards. Um, you know, the music would just play in my head and reading them and listening to music while I'm reading comics and stuff. And I wanted to do that myself also. I worked out the other offices and I would work in these uh, comics you know, just because they put soundtracks in there. And I thought that made sense to me. So it's just, it's always really not the other, you know, to me. And uh, you know, also just coming up with ideas and stuff, musical is inspired specific scenes for uh, characters and storylines and things, you know, so just, it just came out and came together to me, and it just makes sense to have it. And uh, we don't need to proceed in a more early fashion. Anybody who would like to address this question is more than welcome to. Yeah. You know, I grew up, my experience of music growing up was listening to vinyl, uh, starting with my parents' Beatles records, but uh, the experience of putting a, a physical record onto a turntable was for me always very interconnected with, uh, with the beginnings of my listening to music. And so I would put these records on and put them on, and while I was listening to them, I would study the albums. And, uh, and you know, starting with Beatles records, those album covers are so beautiful, and for records that were gatefolds, I would look through the liner notes, which in a way, in my head, was almost like a, a primitive experience of sequential art. You know, I was kind of looking at these amazing pieces of artwork and imagining stories in my head as I flipped through the pages of the notes. And uh, so to me, uh, music was always a very visual form of art. Uh, that, that was my experience of it. I always had stories kind of in my head when I was listening to music, or it would bring music work was, would bring back memories for me, and those memories were obviously connected to something that happened. So to me, music and story were always uh, always entwined, so it didn't seem like such a stretch uh, to put the two things together when I found a story that felt right for the medium. To, to me, um, I actually came about it a different way, but like why I incorporate music so much in my comics was more the um, interesting thing with comics, it, and compared to like any other medium, you don't get the, you don't have the ability to put a soundtrack or music or noise in there, and so I was looking at stories of how do, you, how do you sort of um, play around with the idea of evoking some emotion and things like that? Because you can't look overlay that. You, know, you don't get a chance to do those bells and whistles. So I started playing around with the idea of you know, doing things like playlists. You know, it's not the first time, but you know, especially popular music, we all know those songs. And those songs trigger something. So I was like, can we really match you know, some of these songs with what you're reading? You know, you have the option not to, but it's sort of like, as a way of enhancing your, your um, you know, the, the, the experience of reading a comic. So I started doing that, and, I was, and then I started embedding some lyrics, you know, in, you know, either in the notes or online, and just different things. And so I just started getting more and more fun to try to do it that way. And so, yeah, that's a challenge, I guess, why I wanted to be looking at these uh, I'm going to flip to the other side, and uh, Marky, uh, the Ramones are the band that at least in my mind, best solidifies that comics and pop music connection, not just because of my own personal experience of listening to the first Ramones albums, uh, particularly, I guess, the end of the century was the one that was always on. Um, but also, you know, covering the Spider-Man theme and doing the Weird Tales box set that you... Well, you know, it's strange. Uh, <coughs> Road to Ruin was basically one of the first album covers that had uh, a full uh, front cover of us as a cartoon. But what was strange is Joey and Johnny didn't like to be associated with cartoons. But once one, when we were on The Simpsons, you know, they go, we arrived. You know? <laughs> so, you know, I mean, when you listen to the lyrics of the Ramones or any, any Ramon album, there's definitely something that you can think of uh, that, that can become uh, visual with the music and you can put into a comic book like uh, Give Me Give Me Shock Treatment. Uh, I don't want to be a pinhead no more. Uh, <laughs> Go Mental. Uh, let's see, what are the great titles all there? Uh, uh, I Don't Want to Go Down to the Basement. Pet cemetery, yeah. uh, and things like that, you know. But uh, we have uh, also the Spider-Man theme for.
for uh, the uh, song that we did, but doing the videos too, not just in, uh, on, on paper, you know. But when I was a kid, I really liked uh, the Fantastic Four and liked the Four. I liked uh, a lot of the Marvel stuff, you know. And uh, then uh, as, as I got older, I was glad to be asked to join the Marvels because I really thought we were walking, living cartoons. John Holmes did a great job with the mic. He, uh, yeah, he, he was, he was uh, involved, involved with it, but we had him okay with stuff when we saw it. You know, I mean, uh, that's, that's the way, that's how it is a lot of times. But, you know, I mean, you have a band. Say, for instance, Kiss. That obviously, they look like a cartoon. They look, they look good as a unit, where you can make a great comic book or a cartoon of, of the band itself, like the Ramones. And even like the early Beatle cartoons uh, were great too, which went along with their songs. So, you know, I feel that if you become a cartoon or you're in, 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 a, in a comic or a series, uh, you arrived. <laughs> Definitely. You know? um, so then. Uh, I feel like the fact I'm on a panel with Marky Ramon means I've arrived. <laughs> <laughs> Youth liking the Beatles and being involved uh, uh, with, with how they formed and developed, uh, like with Brian Epstein uh, in, in Liverpool and how they met and all this other stuff and how uh, it, it keeps the, their legacy alive. You know, that's it's just good to see that. You know, so uh, it does it does go together. Music, the visuals, uh, whether it's in, comic book or whether it's a, a movie or a short, it, it does all go together. Yeah, and the ruins had a very specific visual aesthetic that just really, you know, there was a look to that band. It was a super team. It was a good team. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's all in my book, January 15th, that's coming out. Um, we, uh, you know, this, we, we were, we were, we were, and that's what that's what you got. Um, so I'm going to switch a little bit. Um, Alex, John, and Jennifer, you all, you, um, you have some, you have a number of creative projects amongst you, but you also are involved in the like marketing and sales of these comics that have really helped bring this music comics fusion into more of the mainstream um, and you know, image comics with. Uh, we've been buying a phonogram and the Bell and Sebastian book and uh, Deadly Classic playlists. And Alex, I mean, obviously the Archies, when you think of a cartoon band, it's the Archies is usually the first thing you go to. And then the Archie means Kiss. Um, and John with you know, Scott Pilgrim and Blue Monday and Sweet Girl and Hopeless Savages and all the rest of the Pony Pebble. So, how do you go about marketing that? Because I keep finding, I keep hearing about these things through my music friends and not just my comics friends, and that's a really wonderful thing. I mean, to me, from a publicity standpoint, it's a new opportunity to open up a whole new, for, you know, wave of contacts and uh, and ways to promote the books. So I think, you know, with Archie Kiss, that was the one. I, I kind of cringe thinking it out the lack of professionalism when that came up in a meeting, and I said, I'll write that, you know, <laughs> as opposed to saying, this is how we're going to promote it. Um, but yeah, music and comics to me, it's a no-brainer. So I've never really separated the two for me. Even even the writing process for me involves building a playlist. And I'm, I've got playlists for Archie Kiss. I've got playlists for my novel. It just I've never had a moment when they felt like two different things. You know, with the act of reading a comic, I always you know what what album matches this book or what playlist works with them. Um, so as far as promoting them or publicizing them, it's really just it, to me it seems like an opportunity. Reach out to new people. It's, uh, it's, it's always exciting. Yeah, I think that uh, music and comics are both so best experienced kind of viscerally. Like nobody's listening to uh, a song and, and th picking it apart and thinking like, oh, I think I'm enjoying this part of the song because the drums did this. You know, you just you know, really well, it's not the first time you heard. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, eventually you start obsessing about it. But, um, <laughs> yeah. What microphone did they use? Yeah. 
But, and I think comics are a lot the same way. I mean, I think you can gain more appreciation for it the deeper you delve into it, but ultimately it's that first experience, the first time that you read something, the first time you hear a song. Um, and so I think it creates a shorthand of uh, being able to, to project sort of, uh, you know, an emotional space or you know, a vibe for lack of a better term. Especially if you're doing a playlist for a whole book, it, it really, um, if people can listen to it, uh, or just if they recognize the songs, I mean, it, it's, it's kind of a great shotgun blast of a way to tell somebody, this is what this book is like. And uh, I wish that's, in this day and age, there's so much information over the world, it's just so valuable to be able to, to accurately portray that. Yeah, along the lines of things we kind of viscerally experienced, I think, too, with, um, Something like uh, Kieran Gillen and Jamie McKelvey, they, um, they start out with doing phonogram and recognize the reference down on the cover, the uh, pulp cover. And it's similar to the kind of DIY, indie rock DIY kind of um, aesthetic and, and way of doing things. You can't be too slick in promoting these things. It has to come from a place of authenticity. And with Kieran and Jamie, and you know, I did, um, you know, with Eric doing the Bill and Sebastian um, anthology, it comes from a place of loving music. And so it comes from the creators. They're the ones who really kind of get it to their fans and say, I love this music, it's part of what I do. And so on the publishing side, you know, you don't want to get in the way of that. You want creators to speak to their fans directly, just the way kind of music speaks to people who are listening it, to it directly. And so just, it's being a megaphone for the creators. You, you know, that you want them to, to, to tell people why music is important to their storytelling and then kind of getting their words and their feelings out there. Um, I'd also just add, I don't know if I'll let the Please jump in. <laughs> uh, I think there's something really, especially now, uh, viscerally, even if the consumer doesn't know it, connected about comics culture and music culture. Um, obviously, if you're someone who buys like a single on iTunes and that's how you consume your music, that's a different thing than I think a lot of what we're talking about. But I think the act of going to a comic store, which at this point is a specialty shop, record stores are the same thing. They're both mediums that were everywhere and now the actual physical appreciation of them is sort of subculture in its own way. And I think there's a lot of really good opportunities to mix those. When I did the Wu-Tang Clan comic, we, you know, our first priority was getting into record stores as well as comic stores. And we wanted to put, tell comic stores, we'll put new people in your comic shop who've never been because you, you could get a Wu-Tang Clan comic that's you know, good, and it has amazing artists on it, and it's, it's a quality work. Um, but we also told record stores, like, you'll get something that goes along with the record and makes sense and it's organic. And in a lot of the stuff that I'm working on now, like, record stores get it, and, and record consumers understand the culture of comics in a lot more ways than I think we give them credit. And, I, and so, like, I'm always looking for ways to incorporate music even more and try and include record stores because uh, they're both, at this point, sort of marginalized mediums in the digital age, uh, but they're both really healthy in terms of the passion of the, the people who buy them. As a as by, you know, a convention like this. Yeah. I mean, you know, the people who are downloading their comments. You okay? Um, you know, I think the, uh, the music, the way the music is, is sold, Obviously, there's a sort of instant accessibility of iTunes, but I think most musicians would tell you that's not what music should be. And that's good for selling a lot of records and getting your music out to the widest people, but I think most people I know who are musicians, they want you to buy a record, they want you to hold a record and have liner notes, and this is the record we've ordered and made it in. And comics, I think, is the same way. They don't, you know, you can tour in them and you can, you can download on comicsology, but I think most creators want you in a comic shop. Yeah. It's such a, it's such, a, it. such a tactile experience, just browsing for records, going to the comic shop and rummaging through the... And, you know, the and collecting, like, yeah. things that you like. Yeah. And we can't forget the smell. <laughs> 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 I love the smell. Yeah.
I think that, sorry, Roger, I think that um, eventually what would be really cool is that, you know, the, the person that writes the comic and the musicians that make the song, when you purchase the, uh, the song, the comic, you get both together. You know, as, uh, you know, as an option of buying it, you know. So they, they, uh, they go together. I mean, that would be great to just like, to, to read the comic while listening to the song, the band, and then spy that person to the written comic. You know, that's just my you know, thought. Well, you, you kind of did that with the weird tales box set. Like, I picked that up, and first thing I did was I put on the first disc and pulled out the comic and started reading all of these different people's impressions of music. Yeah, the, um... <laughs> that one thinks of for biography. And you have the rights of Ryan Epstein's story. So why then turn it into a comic book? This is a story that effectively had not been told and it's a really incredibly compelling story about the man behind, for all intents and purposes, the biggest man of all time. So why a comic? <laughs> yeah, for me as a, as a storyteller, it's about just picking what medium is, is most right for your story. And as I, as I was trying to uh, decide how I wanted to tell the Brian Epstein story, I, I decided at first that I wanted to focus on the years he spent with the Beatles, so it's the last seven years of his life, uh, through flashbacks and hallucination sequences and dream sequences and whatnot, you learn about his past a little bit. But it's really about 1961 to 1967. And 1961, Liverpool, where it starts, it's very dark, gray, rainy, industrial, a little depressed. It's very black and white is the way it felt to me. Uh, it ends in 1967 London, which is the birth of the, uh, the psychedelic era. It's the summer of love. Uh, quite literally, there's an event that year called a Technicolor Dream. So in my mind, the arc of the Brian Epstein story mirrored the arc of the movement from black and white to color. And that might not make any sense, um, but as a creator, that's how it felt to me. So I was thinking in terms of colors. And I uh, personally believe that the medium that most effectively, or most powerfully, I should say, um, uses color in storytelling is the comics. And, uh, and that, to me, felt like a natural thing to do. And I, I also just grew up reading comics. I learned to read by reading comics. So it's something I love and I always wanted to do one. So to me, this just felt really right. Uh, and then on, a, on another uh, note, a uh, more mission-oriented note, if you will, uh, the Brian Epstein story is something that's been very inspiring to me. Um, I think the heart of the story is to chase your dreams, no matter how impossible they may seem or, or how unlikely a person to realize, realize them you may feel. And, uh, and I think that's a message that everyone should hear and that everyone should be inspired by. So my goal with The Fifth Beetle is to sp spread that story, is to, is to sing the unsung song of Brian Epstein. Um, and I just felt the graphic novel would more effectively do that. You know, I, I, I could have written a 300-page prose biography about the manager of The Beatles, but quite frankly, who would read that? Like, I would, and maybe a lot of people on this panel would, but, but, but that, that's in some ways preaching to the converted or preaching to the people who may already know something about it and want the fine details. But a graphic novel, you know, it's 128 pages. The artwork, which I have nothing to do with, I'm the writer, the artwork is breathtaking. You know, I wanted to do something that you could pick up in an airport bookstore, flip through it, see that the artwork is beautiful, maybe not be a huge Beatles fan, but be like, I didn't know much about Brian Epstein, and I can read it by the time my flight lands, and, uh, and experience it in, in not dissimilarly to the way you experience a movie, in two hours or in an hour. Um, and to me, I thought that the graphic novel medium would accomplish that as well. So I, 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 I thought it would reach more people, and it would, would uh, tell the story more effectively, uh, and I know I'm going on a little bit, but, but I, should, I, I also want to add that the third reason is that um, I, I came to the Brian Epstein story wanting the business of it all, the research, I wanted to learn the business of the Beatles, the, the behind the scenes Beatles stories. But what most, uh, what most connected me to Brian was the human side of the story. Um, he was gay and Jewish and from Liverpool at a time when those were three significant obstacles. So it, it, was, it, was, it was more my intention with the story 
to tell the, the, the poetry, if you will, the Brian Epstein story, the, the human struggles that he faced. And yes, we get into it through the Beatles, because that's how I got into it, that's why people pick it up, I realize that. Um, but I also, again, feel that if your goal is to tell the poetry, you're gonna get, get that much more through visual art than you will just from the written word. That's, and that's my opinion, I'm not saying that's necessarily right, but that's my opinion. <laughs> I, I think so, and we're all here talking about comics and music. Um, so, uh, I guess Matt, Alex, um, really any of you, uh, trying to feature real artists in your comics, not necessarily in real ways. <laughs> um, but uh, how, do, how do you deal with um, taking, you know, real life, larger than life characters, and then you know translating them? This is for any of you, probably. Um, you know, I think it's a, a real challenge in that it's, it's, you're representing someone in a medium that not only uh, do they have to be actually created, it's not, you know, if you write about someone in prose, it's just words, but actually the vision that you're created, which is, I think, a really good challenge. But it's also a medium that a lot of people aren't, necessarily as familiar with or as comfortable with. And that uh, I was lucky because uh, RZA and Ghostface from the Wu-Tang Clan uh, like comics, <laughs> and so they got it. But it is still, uh, every sort of page and every line of dialogue, you sort of hold your breath as you know they're reading it. Um, I had the very surreal experience of having to uh, hold it up and read it out loud to RZA. <laughs> Uh, the first issue uh, while we had dinner, um, and uh, it's kind of dramatic. It was dramatic. I did voice it, but no. No, but it, it, it was very interesting because he uh, he gets comics and he gets that it's an interpretation of a character much more than you know a film would be in some ways. But uh, his first, I held up the cover, which was beautiful, and his first note. He said, uh, you know, that, that's Ghostface on the cover, and you know, he was the producer of the project, and Ghostface is his, you know, one of his best friends and his bandmate. I said, yeah. He said, oh, you like this cover? And I said, I do. You know, and I talked about the artist and why I liked it. And he said, oh, he said, uh, why is Ghost so fat? <laughs> and I, I literally felt like I was going to puke. I was just like, um, he's muscular. He's wearing a suit, and he's just and he's like, okay, move on. And then, and then he liked everything else. But it, it was a real like. Wake up call that I was like, oh, I'm really playing with real people who have real, you know, public personas that they are very guarded with and very, you know, they're protected with their brand and, and their brand is them and you have to really tread on, you know, I said to, I said to Ghostface the first time I met him, I said, you know, it's my job to make you look good and, and he smiled and I said, as long as you know that. <laughs> and so it's like, it's tricky, uh, but I at least was doing a sanction thing, which in some ways is a blessing and in some ways is a curse, because they look at it and then it would be easier and harder if they didn't. I think all you can do is really hope that they don't mind too much, <laughs> you know, like if you're still taking your ideas and putting them up here, and uh, like if they get blown out, and they do, just do it, you know, hopefully, I mean, yeah, I know, I know, like I put Ant-Man in too, and I know he ended up seeing it, I don't know what he thought of it, but it was just kind of like,
zombifying Riverdale. So I was like, you know how this works. <laughs> uh, but they were, you know, they were super easy to deal with. And you know, you, you hear stories about any, any anybody in the spotlight, you know, how they, how they can be, but you know, they were super easy. And they, they're fake. And that, that I think helped make it easier. Um, yeah. And then sometimes you can't you can't get permission. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Sex Criminals by uh, Matt Fraction and Chip Zdarsky, but that went through a few things because they were making reference. There's a, a Morrissey character. He, he's not Morrissey. He's, he's Esteban, and there's only a couple of it, and he sings about how miserable everything is. <laughs> Very good day in my life. 
you know, note from Paul McCartney and say he admired something I had worked on. Um, but I guess I just kind of plowed forward. I just believed in my project. I loved what I was doing, and I moved forward. Well, 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 the rights thing is a very interesting problem for comics creators. I mean, the, um, especially like an in independent creator like myself, um, I made the mistake, again, because of Peter Casanova and a bunch of other things, that Matt Fraction likes to put in a lot of lyrics, but you have to pay for those lyrics. Yeah. And if you're an independent person like myself, you know, you can get in a lot of trouble. So that my first book, actually, hopefully no one has it in mind. Anyway. <laughs> There's some lyrics in there. Um, but I'm basically in the process of redoing my third um, anthology of Girls Night Out because I use lyrics very much in the story. And it's, it's a difficult position because it's integral to the story. It's set in the 60s, so I use a number, you know, to evoke that feeling of being the 60s. I use very well-known songs, and I'm going to get totally hosed with the rights. <laughs> if they give me the rights, they will ask for money for everything. Yeah. It turns out that if you, you can cite a song by the title, but you can't use the lyrics without permission, because it's like someone taking a, you know, a poem, or, you know, it, it, there, there's a reason for it. Um, so I had to go back, and I used public domain songs that sounded almost like the song that I wanted to use, because I figured you guys won't know the difference, hopefully, <laughs> and it's free. So that's what I'm doing right now, and I have to change it, unfortunately, but, you know, but these are the challenges that you have sometimes when you want to use songs in your, in your stories. Well, the problem is with that is that uh, if you do use a song, you don't get the permission. For the lyrics, you get a cease and desist, and uh, that will stop everything. Then you have to hire a lawyer, and then that uh, becomes a financial situation. And uh, it could go on for years, or you just have to start fresh, and uh, you know something uh, that like you know is to do a song that sounds like a song, you know. But uh, that's what you, you have to uh, confront, though. These publishers, these people who handle your publishing, uh, who, in other words, if you're assigned to Warner Brothers, and you're a band, they get part of the publishing. So the company wants to get paid, too, to sign the artists. So it's like, you know, the Epstein, the Epstein uh, uh, thing, uh, he had to get permission from George's estate, Ringo's, uh, John's estate, Paul, and Ringo, because it's only two deals wide. So, you know, once that's in play and they all agree, that's the way, you know, that's the way to do it. Yeah. Instead of doing it first, uh, before the lawyers, next thing you know, you open the mailbox and there's a letter and they say, you can't do this, so the lawyer told you. So you're ready in deep. So if you start from the beginning, you know, uh, it, it's a lot, uh, it's not so much as a financial strain when you have to deal with lawyers and litigation and all that stuff. You know? well, as someone who has been adapted into comics form yourself, like you're an iconic musical figure who has been in, there was that Weird Tales comic, there was a Marvel comic in the 90s that um, used their own performing the Spider-Man song. There's, yeah. um, there's been, you know, there were John Holmstrom's things originally. Um, and now there's uh, Alan Roberts' Trilogy of My W, which yeah. you, were, you were cast in and are starring in, which is a really interesting take on Who knew? He was in a band in New York, as uh, a Ramones fan, and uh, the next thing I know, I was in, uh, the, uh, you know, in this comic, and uh, with uh, G uh, Frank Vincent from Goodfellas, and uh, Next up, so, yeah. so here we are, all three of us, you know, to, uh, to one guy is a, like a gangster, I'm a musician guy, and she's, she's trying to keep us from fighting each other, so who, who knew, you know what I mean? That's a pretty big yeah. cast. Uh, yeah, and then now, you know, you make, you make a comic, and then they might uh, eventually want to make a series out of it. I've been hearing rumblings that there's going to be the trilogy series from the yeah. yeah, W Studios. Yeah. Oh, it didn't form, so it starts and then, you know, gets to that. So were there any, um, were there any comics that particularly inspired you to do musical comics or records that inspired you to, like, for any of you, were there any, there, there have been a lot of kind of mediocre times over the years. There was a Pat Boone comic in the 50s, 
There were. <laughs> there, there was there was a Cal Sills comic in the late '60s that was um, attempting to catch. Well, when, when, a, when a musician is hot, or individual, or band, they'll they'll make they'll make a record like a uh, William Shatner album, <laughs> uh, which is pretty good album. <laughs> and and Lenny Moore, you know. Uh, Together, the, the popularity of the moment. You know, there could be a comic book made of that artist, an album. So it really depends on the company or the management, and you know, they, they just expand the popularity through that. Were there were there any ones that you saw that you saw and you actually thought were not just cash ins but were good and make you want to do this? Because I mean, as I said, when I first discovered Blue Monday, that was sort of a revelation. I'd seen Kiss comics, obviously. I had the Yellow Submarine adaptation, um, which is questionable. Um, but Blue Monday sort of kicked down the door, and you know, here and Jamie cited it specifically as an inspiration for what they did in front of the ground. <laughs> and like, were were there any for you that like made sense and made you say like, oh, this works um, when you were approaching your own projects? Um, actually. I can't cite a specific book, but the, a specific creator. Um, I love music my whole life and ran a record label and tour managed bands. And, um, I love comics my whole life, but it never dawned on me to make comics. My whole family are writers, both my parents and my brother, and I just never thought about how they're made. And um, a bunch of years ago, uh, someone told me that, uh, just in passing, that uh, Steve Niles, who wrote 30 Days of Night and Chrome Cobb and a ton of stuff, he's a great writer, um, used to play bass in uh, a band, a hardcore band that I loved growing up called Grey Matter. And uh, I didn't know that, and I <laughs> looked online to make sure it was true. And when I realized that it was the same guy, uh, for some reason, uh, even though Steve is probably will always be a better writer than I am, it seemed accessible, it seemed possible that like someone, uh, you know, he, he was in a band in the 80s and I was I never saw him when I was a little kid, <laughs> but um, it, it seemed like someone who was into the stuff I was into, and into the same community, and into the same things, transition to comics, and that's the first person to make it seem possible to me, and that's the reason I write comics. It's not, uh, it was just simply finding out that, that Steve made that transition, and interestingly, uh, Steve and Greg Gerwitz, who's with the guitar Bad Religion, and uh, on Zeptap Records, uh, Bad Religion was another one of my favorite bands when I was a kid, I uh, actually run the publisher who published my Wu-Tang book, uh, and I'm doing another book with them now. So it's a, it's sort of a very surreal experience because uh, two of my favorite musicians from my whole life published my comics that are huge comics people. I love that sort of punk community at the end of Like there was that, um, there, there was that to some degree among comics fans, but particularly in punk circles, there was always that sense of like community and you know, the DIY, I think of like, you know, let's start a record label. And I liked your comments, and it suddenly seemed accessible because who among us hasn't listened to a band that we liked and said, oh, I should work on a play this. Like, you may not be able to play bass like Paul McCartney, but everybody heard the Beatles want to start a band. It, it's funny now because I, I look back and knowing the kind of creators and knowing their, their pedigrees and where they come from, I can see all these creator, comic creator, especially artists, um, and the stuff they did, especially in like punk and hardcore before they were comic creators, but like, um, I actually uh, have a reference of my, my new thing I'm working on to an old Static 13 record cover that Ben Hernandez did, because he did a ton of record covers and a ton of show flyers, but uh, even more recently, Becky Blumen, like used to do flyers all over New York for shows. And going back to the 60s, you had like Rick Griffin and sure. people doing incredible, incredible psychedelic comics and show flyers and posters and all sorts of things. Album covers, I mean, everyone likes the art from cheap reels, but there's many, many other examples of, you know, Neil Adams doing a Groundhog's cover. Yeah. Like, there's, there's a lot of that, and it's another way these things are sort of tied together to the table. No, I mean, I was very inspired by Gerard Way and Umbrella Academy, and we just said of him as a storyteller, not as a musician, but, you know, it's a really excellent comics. I had no idea he was in a band when I picked up that comic. The, the comic came out much later, unfortunately. But there, there was a thought that it would, 
it would be with the album. So, I mean, that, that kind of thinking I thought was just really great, really forward thinking. And um, if I were in any way musically inclined as a musician, that's the way I would do it. Um, but there's other things that I just thought were great and not gimmicky. Like, I don't know if you know, Robbie Rodriguez is an artist. Like, I was talking about this crazy art, and then he, like, he handed me an actual vinyl like record, which unfortunately I can't play because I don't have a record player. But it was like, the most awesome thing with the comic and, you know, and the music together. And I have a broken record player that I'm going to have to try to fix to put in this thing. But, you know, it's awesome. So for the, uh, the, there's also, you know, those comics that don't reference specific music, but just sort of capture it. And I mean, Scott Fulgermans, again, one of those ones that people think of immediately. There's also a lot of those image books that, you know, Wicked and Divine is doing it right now. It's not really, it's not really referencing any specific songs in the way that Kieran has in the past. Um, but it's obviously, you know, it's Bowie. It's like he is he's using glam mythology, he's using punk mythology, he's using a lot of that imagery that you know rock and roll created. And it's it's always interesting to me that like you know, Johnny done a great job of getting that stuff out there and you know, and Jennifer is like, you know, images you know, images and only are generally the first two publishers that I think of when I'm thinking of those sorts of things, but have there been any obstacles in doing that? Like, or do they just sort of find their audiences naturally? Um, there's always kind of a period of adjustment. I mean, you have to think about who, who you're trying to, to, to get to. But I think part of what I always like to do is, is just try and get it as many people as possible to find an audience, and then try and, and interact with that audience and get people feel involved. Because ultimately, you know, it's people that are experiencing the same thing on some level. And so, you know, I, I, think, I think it's something that's really special when, when you get a book like, like Scott Pilgrim or Sex Criminals that, that people are just rabid about um, and, and that they found a lot of meaning in. Um, you know, I think, I think that's something that, that is to be shared. And uh, it can be tough, but ultimately, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of just finding a common thread between <laughs> the Karen and Jamie's the first book, Phonograph, it I mean it it was much beloved but not, you know, widely beloved. It had a you know a core group of It had a tiny but rabbit fan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they who really got it and really connected with it and um, but it, it didn't get the, the you know the huge audience, but you know, Karen and Jake went on to do Young Avengers, they you know, got more of an audience that way. And now with the Wicked and the Divine, um, just more people are finding out about it and connecting with that sense of, of um, just the, the feeling of music and comics together and, um, and their, Jamie and, and Karen's passion about it as creators. Well, effectively, they released a whole bunch of singles that were, like, you know, smash hits, and then came back and started making, like, their record. Right, that, yeah. You know. I mean, yeah, you can look at the at Phonogram as kind of their, their kind of, you know, recording in a garage album. And mm -hmm. they're, they're finding their sound, and they found their sound. And it's yeah, they signed to a major label, they released a bunch of things, and now they're off on their so own, not <laughs> doing any <laughs> making the incredible <laughs> opus. <laughs> for the comic of somebody uh, who's going to do Stairway to Heaven. <laughs> <laughs> it's about what, nine minutes long. <laughs> the encyclopedia. So I, I it doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, what I love is that there's those, I mean, there really is that fundamental element of comics and music that they're both incredibly visceral forms. Like, you hear... You hear the record, and before you hear what the words are saying, you hear that beat, and you hear that riff, and you're driven to seek it out. And with comics, like, you see one splash of visual, and you're like, that's the book. You get those, just, you get those things that, you know, affect you as a kid. They affect you on an unconscious level. And, you know, it's, you know, there's the great creators, there's the great bands, there's the great musicians, there's these people, like, you know, you hear the opening, I mean, you hear the one, two, three, four, and that beat kicks in at the beginning, and 
you get the amazing splash page when you open a Marvel comic and there is the thing standing in the rain looking depressed and you are drawn in. You open to the next page where you go on to the first verse and all the words and everything kick in, but you're already hooked from that initial moment. Yeah, I think it's really magical to have that synergy when you're doing a music comic. I, I found what I found the most challenging challenging is evoking that moment that you get musically, you put the record on and you start popping your head and you hear the bass line. Having that translated to art, and you see it done almost, it seems effortless when you read like Love and Rockets or some of the ones that you know our panels done, but having that overlap when you have that musical moment represented in art and when you're opening that book and you feel the music, that to me, that's when you're doing it right. Yeah, and yeah, what do I want to comment? That makes me want to dance. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and we are out of time. Um, it has been great, and we could go on for far longer. Um, thank you all so much. Uh, I'm just going to go down the line and please uh, promote like what you have on the way. What is going on right now? The big. Yeah, so, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're adapting the Good Beetle into a film, so that's the main thing that I'm working on. Uh, I also do quite a bit of um, producing on Broadway. I uh, recently produced Green Day's American Idiot, and uh, I'm now working with Alanis Morissette to adapt her album Jagged Little Pill for the stage. Um, so if you're interested in either of those projects, uh, Fifth Beetle can be found on Twitter at Fifth Beetle, um, on Facebook, and uh, at our website, which is fifthbeetle.com. And for uh, the Jabber Little Pill project, um, that's at its very early stage, uh, stages. Uh, so if you want to learn more about that, you should follow me at, at the big J Tawari, um, or at my company website, which is tawariint.com. Thank you. Um, my uh, the Wu Tang Clan comic I worked on, Twelve Is a Die, will be in trade in January. I've been told. Um, with a new Pablo Rivera cover, which I'm very excited about. And uh, you should buy it, it's very weird. Um, <laughs> and uh, I do a free webcomic online at a site called tripcity.net. Uh, it's called Menu. Uh, it's a ton of different artists doing a single subject anthology, and that subject is a boy and a dog in a world that's around food. So sometimes it's very funny, and sometimes it's very sweet, and a lot of times it's them killing and eating people. And uh, I have an upcoming creator own book uh, coming from Black Mask Studios in 2015 called You Can Never Go Home that uh, I'm very excited about and in seven months you should buy it. I have um, a short story, I think it's still out in the Vertigo Quarterly about an um, aging R&B singer in the near future in Detroit. Um, I also have um, the third issue of Girls' Night Out, which I was saying is an anthology, uh, which has some um, musical influences. We're at the Image booth, which is 2729. We have a couple of convention exclusives. This is Deadly Class, inspired by Rick Remender's. Uh, not entirely misspent youth in the punk scene. It's at 1987 in San Francisco, in uh, High School for Assassins. And we also have The Wicked and Divine Number no. 2. It's uh, the world tour, only U.S. date, San Diego. Um, edition of uh, Wicked and Divine Number no. 2 by uh, Karen uh, Gillian and Jamie McKelvey. And we still have them, so you can find it. Uh, you can buy my first crime novel, uh, Silent City, uh, uh, on my website, alexfer.com, or Amazon, or Barnes & Noble. Um, I didn't get into the lyric quoting discussion because I do quote a song that, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, you can find, I have a novel too. It's uh, yeah. an e-book online. It's called Half Person, Cody Marcy, the title. And, <laughs> yeah. But I, I do quote a little teensy bit of the lyrics, but you can find it on Amazon and any other you know, e-book. Yeah, please come to Pop Pop and we'll do And, uh, uh, but, uh, you can also, Archie Meets Kiss has become strangely enough a perennial seller for Archie, so I'm, I'll be signing that at the Archie Boots model from uh, 12 to 1. Uh, and I'm also writing Archie 659 and 660, so they turn into animals, and Archie uh, plans four dates for one night. And my second book will be out next year. Yeah, oh, Archie. Uh, you can find me and, more importantly, a lot of awesome comics at the Oni booth at uh, 1833. We've got a ton of uh, exclusives and signings, and we're doing lots of cool little mini events and stuff like that. Uh, more than I uh, have time to accomplish the list right now. But uh, again, it's booth 1833.
I'll make it simple. Just go to mockyourramon.com. <laughs> but you do have a book coming out. Yes. The book comes out when? Uh, January 15th, and I'll be here tomorrow. Too. And uh, Monday's coming back soon, so uh, keep uh, checking out the price.com and uh, see if I move and get out of those issues. And uh, Marky is doing an after party tonight at uh, the Till Two Club uh, with, uh, with Giselle and the Black Mambas, and Marky will be spinning. It's uh, the Till Two Club at 4746 El Cayon Boulevard. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> And he is signing all day tomorrow at Table J. Um, I'm having a brief contact with Bill Thank you. And Patrick and I are doing a 15-year-old panel tomorrow.